And with that, I'd like to uh, introduce uh, Andrew. Um, Andrew Singel is, is uh, from Seattle. Blue here from Seattle. He's a software developer specializing in web applications with a focus on building user interfaces to complex and unusual tasks. Uh, his latest endeavor, which he'll be talking about, uh, uh, is he's going to talk about uh, interactive design with a back end implementation common list. And with that, let's give a warm welcome to Andrew. Thank you, Arthur. So, as developers, how many of you feel sometimes like you just run in the same circles over and over again? Anybody? Yeah, same here. So today we're going to be talking about Seed. Seed is an interactive software environment built on Common Lisp. And in my experiences building software and watching it break down, I've discovered that traditional software systems stand like castles atop shifting silicon sands. Well, some of them are more like sandcastles before a tidal wave. But in any case, there's the build-up, the anticipation, system runs, and then eventually the falls form, the cracks appear, things start falling apart, use cases change and evolve, and the system cannot change to meet them. So what is Seed? Seed aims to be a universal interface that can encompass any computer function. This interface has as its basis an alternative display of the common Lisp language. But you can layer extra interface features over the basic language structures. So you can apply layer upon layer of these special interface elements over Lisp and eventually the baseline programming language disappears and a new interface is manifested on top of it. So why would I use Common Lisp for a task like this? Seed requires advanced metaprogramming, including reader macros, which change how your compiler reads the code. And Common Lisp is really the only game in town when it comes to these things. So let's talk some more about that problem I identified, this inevitable breakdown of systems. I created large web applications in the past. And as the use cases evolved, it turned out that they just weren't flexible enough to meet them. And then comes the breakdown, the anticipation of a new system, development of a new system. But the cycle just keeps repeating itself. So I asked, why do these systems that we build keep crumbling? Why do they inevitably fall apart? And after contemplating this for a long time, and through a kind of strange chain of coincidences, readings of different things and a few conversations, I came to understand that technology is something we place between ourselves and the world, and thus there are two frontiers to technology. Implementation is the frontier between technology and the world. Well, design is the frontier between people and technology. Implementation is how it works, and design is how we experience it. So residents of either frontier often find it difficult to see into the other. These, well, frankly, sometimes these groups abhor each other or sometimes just misunderstand and wish that the other would just go away. And then this discord between groups is manifested in software faults. And these two groups chasing their own tails is what's at the heart of software and many of the problems that we see in it. So how can this be addressed? Lisp is unique in that it, um, it's a syntax language with a syntaxless language with a regular structure. And what that means is that Lisp's implementation has a, consi it, it has a remarkable consistency when you think about it. Compare it to C, Python, just about any other language. And Lisp has a regularity to it. You could say this is a purity of, of sorts of implementation. So then what would be the corresponding design? Is there a, prim is there a primal, you could say, design of Lisp processing to complement the implementation? So this may seem like a tough question, but if I asked it in a different way, let's say that you're going to talk to somebody who 
sees a computer as simply an appliance for work and social media, somebody with very shallow understanding of technology, and you're going to say to this person, I want to use a computer to do list processing. I, want, I have a bunch of lists, and they have information in them, and some of the things in the list is actually rules for doing other things with lists, and I want to put these in a computer and like process them. What do you think they would recommend to you? Anybody? What was that? And what sort of a program is that? A spreadsheet. A spreadsheet is the elemental, primal, whatever design of list processing. So what you see here on the, uh, on the right hand is the tree grid display of Lisp. This is Lisp code displayed in a, um, in a, a tree fashion. Parentheses, as you can see, are absent. Instead, indentation is used. It's not necessarily efficient in the uh, spatial layout, but we're going to see techniques, for for techniques to mitigate that later on. So Seed directly sublimates this graphical interface from, that is uh, interactive for users into compiled program code. And this obviates the model view controller interactions that you see in most software. So let's give this a look right now. Here we can see the uh, Seed's kind of portal root, in, root interface. It's got this fun scrolling star pattern, which is randomly generated every time you reload the system. We're going to load up the spreadsheet demo. And now we've got uh, our tree grid. So that this uh, top element here, the cell A235, is the equivalent of writing what you see there. Make sense? Yeah. Can you zoom in? I can't see it even at this Want to zoom in a bit? Yeah. Look good? All right. So this is a program for the spreadsheet over here. The spreadsheet is one type of data output seed supports. So cell A2 is set to 35. You see here that A2 is 35. I, sell, I set cell C1 to the sum of these three numbers. You see that over here. I set the, you can set, uh, use the cells macro to set a cell range. I set cell C5 through E9 to 3 plus the value number. And this val number is equal to whatever number was in the cell before. If there's no number there, it defaults to zero. So many of these cells you see are set to three, but then these here are set to 13.75. This dot in the upper right-hand corner of them means that there was one value there before and that a single iteration has been performed on that value. So the view gives you an idea how many iterations have happened in these spreadsheet cells. So this implementation is uh, I think fewer than 100 lines of code, the core of it. Probably can't do a whole lot compared to Excel, but there's one thing it does which you will never see Excel do, and that is that I can store a function in one of these cells as a value. In cell B7, I store this lambda, which simply adds 4 to its argument, set here. At the bottom, observe, at cell D16, I fun call the function from cell B7 on the value from cell D12. Cell D12 is a 4, so 4 plus 4 is 8, as we see down there. This is one example of the kind of uh, workflow that Seed enables. Let's take a look at some more. Who here is familiar with the APL language? Any APL fans? Nice. So, although there's, you know, there's that common adage that any sufficiently large, any, any programming language that progresses sufficiently will include a buggy, uh, poorly implemented equivalent of half of common Lisp. 
One thing that doesn't exist a whole lot in common Lisp is array processing functions. So I thought I would implement my own APL to uh, add in a little more a uh, array processing. So what you see here on the left is uh, an APL, my dialect of APL called April, which compiles to common Lisp. Now, APL, you know, dealing with 3D array, yes, yes, so question? This April, right, uh, is this, are you using, um, are you using reader macros to, ca to turn those characters? I know that it doesn't use read it doesn't use reader macros. It uses a uh, parser called a uh, parser framework called MaxPC, okay. created by a German guy named Max. Uh, so he wrote a basically parser framework. Mm -hmm. So the special characters are implemented via that framework. Then uh, you know APL dealing with arrays is lots of fun, but you know kind of boring just you know seeing those fields of numbers print out in your REPL. I thought, is there any flashier uh, implementation I could create for vector output? So I took this uh, Minecraft, you know, this WebGL Minecraft library, hooked it in to the uh, April, and here we've got Minecraft style 3D voxel world output. You can see here that we've got add walls and add floor functions. So, and then the actual space is a 16 by 16 by 16 array of zeros. That just means the zeros are empty space and, and materials are a index number. So I add, wall, I add walls made of material number one and floor made of material number two. This red material here is floor, green material here is the walls. And uh, I assign a single point to the value four, and that's this dark cube over here. Let's see what happens if I change this, and then I hit Shift S to save. the black cube is now higher. So this 3D space just repeats indefinitely. For now it's just a little demo, but who knows what interesting things you could build with this. Maybe some kind of gamified interface for big data tasks, something of that nature. They can need like a pickaxe and then you can do data mining. Right. <laughs> data Minecraft. Yeah. So in seed, there are not interfaces to programs. In seed, the interface is the program. The interfaces that you just witnessed compose directly into Lisp code. And then let's get another look at that. I'm going to open up the demo drawing. So some of you may be familiar with SVG graphics. Let me, I think that I need to, uh, reduce the size to normal, or maybe not. This should be legible enough. So you see here an SVG vector image on the right. On the left is the code that generates it. So this is using the uh, CL with HTML output. I forget the name, but in any case, so this is using the uh, Lisp2 HTML library to generate SVG code. So some of this looks pretty typical SVG. You've got XY position of this rectangle, height and width. But then here, this is not normative Lisp code. This is a color picker. Choose that, click Save, and the color changes. And here, this color, instead of being a color picker or a regular string, is a drop-down menu. Let's change this, click Save, and it changes. Now it looks so like... there's a way of associating, like is there like a color data type, and then there's a way of associating an interface to it? Like to say, oh, this is a color, use this. How did you... Uh... Let's take a look at that in a moment. And uh, I'm not sure that we can actually... 
Okay, we had to zoom out, but on the right here, our resolution is a bit low. Normally you could see this better. You can see dots arrayed in a Fibonacci spiral. So these are just strings with funny suits on, but this is an entire macro abstracted using this uh, element display here. So let's first erase some of those dots. Save, and you see the number of dots has decreased. Now let's add more of those small green circles back in, mix in some big blue circles. And we have a bigger spiral. So this shows how you can abstract a sophisticated macro inside an interface. And regular user doesn't have to deal with all that. So let's take a little walk down uh, memory lane, for me at least, and we can see some of the program, some of the tasks that led me to seed. A previous project of mine was a choose-your-own-adventure game builder called the Scenario Engine. So we're going to play very briefly one of the scenarios I devised. This is an ethics training module for accountants. I'm going to start this scenario. It's like a choose-your-own-adventure game. And then, I do not believe we are connected to Wi-Fi right now. Um. Does anyone have Link it, NYC free? No, let, me, let me ask downstairs about the Wi-Fi. Okay, we'll uh, break from that and look at a different uh, topic for now. <coughs> so, well, uh, if you'd like to check with them. Yeah, I'll, I'll do that. Yeah. So, you may have observed previously the tree-like imagery. present, uh, the, the branching patterns present within the code display. Let's zoom in so we can see that better. These I call dendroglyphs, and they indicate different types of data within the Lisp expressions. So this narrow line and wider line represents a macro. This small line, which may branch downwards like this represents a number. This complicated symbol represents a string. Here we see this horizontal pointing line represents a symbol and this emblem here represents a macro. So what's the rhyme and reason to this system? The dendroglyphs are based on the concept that programming exists at the intersection of symbol and order. So horizontal lines represent relationships of, or of symbolism, whereas vertical lines represent relationships of order. Each expression is lined by a vertical on the left because the expressions represent lists, sequences of elements of some kind. The first element is always upper left, and then the following elements are down on the right-hand column. So the symbol, the, the, the symbolism, symbols are always denoted by horizontal lines because the symbols, and then it takes this 45 degree turn and intersects with the order. So the horizontal line immediately calls attention to symbols, given their importance in the Lisp language, and a few other, uh, a few other codes here. You see this, uh, perpen this small perpendicular line, these small perpendicular lines represent a character. The small line with no perpendicular represents a number because a number is like the quantum of order. The perpendicular represents that a character is like a quantum of meaning, a quantum of symbolism. And then the uh, two parallel lines with the perpendicular represent T because true is essentially a quantum of, a quantum of meaning that always equates to itself. And then if we take a look at some, key, at some uh, keyword symbols, keyword is represented by two horizontal lines merging into the vertical because two of the two parallel lines, two same length lines indicate something that is equivalent to itself. 
keyword always evaluates to itself. And then the macro is narrower line with wider line to the left because a macro expands to create code, whereas a function is two parallel but, uh, but staggered lines because a function is basically some value being changed in some way to become another and then merging with the order downward. So that is a summary of the dendroglyph vocabulary and then more being devised, of course. So how many symbols are there in the vocabulary? Uh, in the vocabulary at the moment, One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. And then there's some. I decided to uh, delay the arithmetic for now because the way the grammar works is you can be specific on the level of just is it a symbol or a string, or you can go down to specific symbols for an individual glyph. But the space will is kind of constrained, so it's important to uh, right. control the mention. yeah to control the fan out. Was there a question? Um, at the end of each like, block, there's some sort of, like, complicated thing there? Uh, yes. This? Yeah. That is uh, just the arithmetic symbol for plus. This is arithmetic for times and plus. So I decided to do away with the arithmetic symbols for now because I'm making sure that the space, basically that the, the name space, as it were, doesn't fill too quickly. So contemplating the different... Uh, variations of symbols and how to uh, best have dendroglyphs that cover a variety of the common lisp symbols. So that's the dendroglyph up close. And the key takeaway here is that one cell equals one atom. So let's reiterate one cell in the, in the, in the tree grid interface means one atom in lisp. And that's the principle of atomic identity. So why is atomic identity important? Because in normative Lisp, atoms are represented by strings of characters. And many people complain about the parentheses in Lisp, and it's hard to read. But I don't think there's really a problem with parentheses in Lisp. If there's a problem with Lisp, I would say that problem is text. Because text is not atomically aligned with the structure of Lisp. Each of these text strings are Lisp atoms. Oops, looks like I just broke an atom and made my program nonsense. Whereas here, my point is on one atom at a time. I can hit space to toggle editability. I may break one atom, but I've just, bro I've, I've just corrupted that one atom. I have not made more atoms or made nonsense of my program structure with a single action. And then... It's, it's kind of structure. Structure? It's like a structure editor. Yes. Uh, Arthur, did you uh, get the Wi-Fi information? Yes, it's uh, RGS Wi-Fi. RGS Wi-Fi. Yeah. And the password is... Uh, uh, dollar how biz one all lowercase. Dollar how h o w biz one b i z one. Uh, digit one. Yeah, the digit one. Looks like we're going. Okay, so let's take a look at a more traditional software architecture.
what is the diagonal line on the other What is the diagonal line? Yeah, for example, we were showing. Yeah, G9 is the diagonal line. Division. Oh, that's the division oh, sign. Oh, okay. Oh, and uh, let me mention what this system, the, so this is a string representative. Remember how this little thing at the bottom with the vertical and the perpendicular represents character? Repre this represents, basically means series of characters. And the complexity of this symbol kind of corresponds to the distance of strings from the fundamental Lisp data structures. Not necessarily a, you know, the most basic structure in Lisp. So by gl just glancing at a page of these symbols, once you're sufficiently accumulated, you can intuit what the program is doing. So let's look at these scenarios. So like I said, these are basically educational choose your own adventure games. I can name my character. I'm a new employee at this company. I've been clicking through spreadsheets all day. I receive an email. Sales manager says, hey, we just closed a 1.5 million sale. Could you book this ASAP? I prepare to log the sale, but I realize that there's no backup documentation confirming the sale actually happened. So what will I do? Let's not log the sale, do the right thing to start with. I'll call my supervisor. Hi, Ed, what's up? So I can wimp out. I can start probing. I can get right to the point. Let's do that. He doesn't seem to want to listen. I'm going to push the issue. And he still blows me off. So from this point, I can do stuff like leave my desk, go to the break room, and make myself some coffee. I'll take the coffee black. This is really a waste of time, isn't it? But see, a waste of time can stimulate the creativity. It can take a person out of their quiz-taking mindset and into a more receptive state of mind. But that's basically the scenario engine. But let's see how this was engineered. This is the back-end editing interface with some of the uh, design principles that would later go into the, the uh, seed system. I'm going to load this scene up. Now we see a list of uh, graph elements. I click on this node and then over on the right, you can see in these amber boxes, written that material that you were being shown at the beginning of the scenario, those text items. And this interface is data-driven. You see the narrator appears and says, you see an image of. It is driven by this configuration file back here. The narrator appears and says, you see an image of. And here was where I started to see the limits of JSON and JavaScript. This is a Node.js application. Notice how here, in this settings, I have object generate, actions, and then each of these pairs of event che description, check description. In the world variables, I do metaprogramming. The stuff here is available as the primal.settings object, so I iterate through it and generate some content for the world variable state, which is the persistent state in this game. Now, the important thing to understand here is that this is a graph. All these here are the nodes or vertices in the graph. And as I open up these expander buttons, I am viewing the edges from each of these vertices that connect them. Let's zoom in a bit so we can read. So at this initial decision, you remember I decided not to log the sale. I decided to investigate. I can call my supervisor. And this is the start of his conversation. And see, this same node is highlighted both here and here because they're the same thing. You don't see all the nodes in the graph at once, but you see them, you see just the connections that you need to at the time. So this allows you to create a very complex graph without much uh, cognitive overhead that's often associated when you do them in a spreadsheet or with any common method. So. This system was nice for what it was. There's a lot of metadata conveyed in these icons, for instance, like this red bar indicates the presence of executable code. The uh, intruding spokes here correspond to mentions of the world variable, the W. But I still faced 
inflexibility with this system. I had people asking about different use cases and to accommodate those I would have had to rewrite major parts of the controller. This interface you see here is written in thousands of lines of code and more thousands are required to transform the data that's edited here into the internal model. Now let's take a look at back at seed and check out the graph view mode. So these are the same type of nodes that we were viewing before. Just a simple three node network connecting to each other. Now if I edit the second node, you'll see that the change is manifested over on the left. So this is taking up perhaps I think it's less than a twentieth of the amount of code required to implement the scenario engine you just saw. The actual, now, the total line count of scenario engine is over 20k. Total line count of seed is currently under 10k. And this is just a small sliver of seed's capability in driving this, uh, this interface. So that gives you an idea just how much leverage you gain when you harmonize implementation and design by putting an interface like creating an interface like this that can compose directly to code. Yes? I think this would be a great life DEF DEFCON? DEFCON. DEF oh, DEFDOC, yes. Well, yes, one of my uh, projects, not really ready for the light of day yet, has been a rich text editor. So that's using Slate, which now this, uh, let's talk a bit about the engineering of this. We'll get back to that. Seed is a React application. All the things you see on screen are React components. The most common component is the form view. So this, which you see here, is the form view. But is this the only form view on screen? It isn't. This is a form view as well, which you see on the far left. And this is also a form view. So this is, a, this is considered a large Vista. Each of these column segments is, is called a Vista in seed parlance. This is a lar this is a or standard Vista. This is a short Vista, and this over here is a brief Vista. So in the short Vista, you see instead of the grid type list, you see a single one-dimensional list. So main and cells are in a group together. APL and space are in a group together, and graph and node are in a group together. And you don't have to only do two split screen. You can have the uh, element take up the entire screen, or you can add them to the list until you get uh, many columns, which would probably be illegible. But uh, so this is a list just in a different format than what you see over here. Now, taking a look back at demo drawing, you might notice that this drop-down menu is of the same style as this drop-down menu here. That's because they're simply the same type of meta format applied in both this place and this place. And the menu at the footer here is a form as well. So that means that all of the work that's gone into creating dis uh, UI elements for this display is applicable here, 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 and here with some changes. So we're going to reload the system real quick. Oh, I forgot to erase my mistake. Yes, <laughs> fragility demonstrated. Mm -hmm. Wait, so you're telling me that this like, meta UI is self-generated? Yes. So, well, let's we'll get into that in a moment here. Well, let's talk about how this, how each of these UIs is made up. So from 
So back to the interface principles. From We were talking about principles of atomic identity. One atom is an atom. Visual atom is an implementation atom. And from that principle arise the principle of iterative orthogonal abstraction. That means that a software system can be abstracted into a user interface by steps. You saw some very simple steps when I had those drop-down menus, that color picker, that Fibonacci interface. And you could layer elements until you get something that's more akin to the scenario creator here. You have these queue lists. You might notice that this is similar to the Fibonacci interface. You have this queue list and these text fields that you can fill out. And then as well as defining a new mode of expression for common lisp, Seed makes common lisp systems interactive in a new way. So Seed uses a unique domain specific language to define how the inputs and outputs in a system behave. So the way it works is input from users causes changes in Seed systems. And these changes are reflected in the output that users see. So the relationship between the input and output is defined by domain-specific I.O. language. So seed systems have copy and paste functions along with an undo history, like you have in a typical editing tool. And what you see on the right here is a minimal I.O. spec. This is the I.O. language used in seed. And this code is all that you need to implement this you need to implement this code editor and the associated spreadsheet. So let's take a look at that in the editor. I hope you can read this. Lots of pain. I'm not sure what's going on here. Hang on, I'm going to copy paste this. That looks a bit better. Thank you. So let's take a look at the anatomy of this I.O. spec. So this is the core of any seed system, the language that you're looking at here. Every I.O. spec has a stage. The stage is literally this, what you're looking at here. The entire display is called a stage and I set the display parameters. So remember how main and cells are a group, APL and space are a group, graph and node are a group? This is how they're all made up in the spec. Main cells, APL, space, graph, and node. So if I put three things in here, I'd get a three column layout. If I put one in here, I'd get a single big uh, element. And then the adjunct elements are the clipboard and history. So let's look at how clipboard and history work. So you're probably used to copy pasting things in programs. Let's copy paste some stuff right now. And it looks like we're suffering from some demoitis, but uh, long story short, I can, if I hold down the C button and press right, you notice that things are appearing in this list with a square at the top. Those are the, th are the items I'm pasting. If I use C up, if I hold C and press up and down, I iterate through the list of pasted things, and then C left is supposed to paste it in. 
Looks like I'm having some problem there. But uh, let's make some changes to something. You'll notice that the ticks over on the left here are increasing. Now, if I hold the W key and press left, I'm stepping back through the list of changes. So these are the adjunct clipboard and history display. The adjunct display is in a brief view, a brief vista. So it's uh, you know, kind of like watch scale. You'd say this is like PC scale, this is like a smartphone scale view, and this is like a smart watch scale. But potentially, you could display these in their own full views. So in most software systems, the clipboard and history are special data structures that uh, have their own specialized way of accessing them and often aren't even that available to developers. But in C, the clipboard and history are just branches like anything else. So that means that uh, they interact with the other branches in a specified way. But you can, um, you can change that if you like. You can basically set up any form of interaction with them that you want. So let's take a look at how that works. This is the specification for the main branch. So let's go back to demo sheet. This branch right here is main. So the main branch, you'll notice that uh, first off, this spreadsheet has some issues potentially with, par with a uh, paradox. If I was to change this, because this generates this, and then I change this, I could create a paradox where it's not certain what is affecting what. Hence, if I change this, this becomes locked and you can't edit it anymore. Unless I hit save, notice the cell value here has changed and it's no longer locked. So once it's saved, it's in a stable state, and then the cells are unlocked. So how is that implemented? Over here, in the, uh, the first thing you get is uh, you state the contingencies, sheet lock, and then I check if the, sheet lock is, if the sheet lock contingency is present, if all the other sheet lock contingent branches are stable. Notice that the cell is also has the sheet lock contingency. If so, I allow the... Uh, the action to proceed. So this, the IO spec language is effectively a data flow language. So in Lisp, usually you're used to, uh, if you want something to affect the output of something else, it has to be inside the expression. So uh, we'll just scratch a little bit here. This makes sense. This doesn't. But the elements of this uh, IO spec are all run through a macro that uh, essentially chains them together, puts them, puts each, uh, <clears throat> puts each function, puts each generated function as the first argument of its successor. So you chain all of these together to create uh, something that would be a lot more confusing if you had to write it the regular way. Hmm? This is monadic I.O. Yeah, but you can have uh, additional pieces of I.O. as well. Each one takes the uh, succeeding, yeah, or takes the preceding node as its node's output as its first argument. Yeah. So the data flows and uh, these stage parameters just define the appearance. They actually don't have anything to do with the function of the, they don't have anything to do with the, fun, with the function that's, that's generated from this. Uh, the spec is simply read by another function that pulls these parameters and uses them to build the interface. But uh, so if the condition is contingent, I check if it's formatted for display. If I do, I pass it through a codec. Notice here, and then I uh, do processing that's necessary for a Lisp form. Then notice I fork it to the history. That means that I send this piece of data, the input that was received to here, gets sent here and, received, and is received as input to the history. And then it's passed through the history filter. So what the history filter does is just adds it to the tail of a list or adds it to the head of a list that exists in the history. And that means it's the latest item in history. And when you're iterating through the history, the rule for that is 
you um, just pull the latest, uh, you pull the item corresponding to your history pointer from the history and load it into your main branch image. Hence the history and then clipboard should be pretty self-explanatory. You can deliberately input things to the clipboard. They're not implicitly entered, you know, because there's no fork to. But when you deliberately enter something, the clipboard it's put in a list. You can adjust the point of the, uh, you can adjust the point in that list. Then when you pull something from the clipboard, it grabs whatever is at that point and pastes it into your main or cells or whatever portion of the document you're working on. And then, uh, Remember when I clicked Shift S or I click this little Save button, it adds the the change has a parameter called Save added to it, and if that parameter is present, <clears throat> then it saves a file with the data of the uh, with the data that's been uh, that's currently in the in the volatile image. So that's how you save these systems as files, and each seed system. Seed is basically a wrapper around ASDF. So notice up here that you have both the package and the ASDF configuration here. So the system feeds ASDF and also uh, some of the material down below here is mined like all the file outputs are you, you mine the paths to those files and use them to populate ASDF's list of files. So there's also, so there's this which is populating the ASDF system definition and there's also some stuff gleaned from down here that populates it. And then with this, it's like you just, uh, a, you just prepend package and the name of this demo sheet onto the beginning of this and that becomes your package.lisp file for the package, yes? So, so basically, you have like a dynamically generated system definition. Correct. Um, and it's yeah, dynamically generated from the rules. Yes. So then here's those APL and space. Note how simple their specs are. And then here's the graph and the node. Clipboard and history. So with this handful of lines, all those interactions between those systems are defined. And let's take a look at what the code actually looks like. So here's demo drawing again. We can see these custom interface elements. So here's that color picker. And the universal tool for creating special meanings and uh, data on top of regular Lisp forms is the meta form. So the meta, the, and then the first argument to the meta macro is always the actual value. And then this if is the interface. And it's, um, I have the output type. And then the type of the element is color picker. So that corresponds to a React component that's loaded and is uh, the information in the metaform is applied to that component in some way. And then the ellipse color chooser you see here, this is of type select, so it's a select menu and this defines the options. So these are used to populate a component and now this is the real big metaform. So this is the Fibonacci points. Note the. F mm -hmm. Is this whole thing generated? Uh, <clears throat> you have to the uh, <clears throat> it's generated. So let's take a look at the. Basically, I created a specification for a menu. So see when I when I hit insert Fibo points. This is going to mess. This is going to mess it up a bit, but no ah, demo white strikes again. But anyway, that was working correctly last time. But when I hit that enter on insert Fibo points, it will generate that meta structure that you saw. So I have to start by manually writing the insert Fibo points menu item. 
But once that's done, you can give people the ability to have a menu that has any number of these custom forms and just paste them into your code. And I'm looking at other ways to do that as well, like uh, have sort of a table of names and you can type in a name to find it from uh, a list, basically. But um, ultimately the goal is you won't have to really type any of these things or anything. There'll be a interface for adding these different special components. So this uses the format, the format is called spiral points expand. And that's a macro that's applied to these points to uh, expand them into the Fibonacci and create the Fibonacci function. So can anybody see a problem potentially with this metaform? Any problems that could happen using this macro this way? Now I remember the name of the HTML output library. It's CLWHO. So CLWHO uses macros itself. The Gen SVG, each of these, you know, that basically wraps it in a CLWHO. And each of these lists is the input to a macro itself. So macros don't evaluate their arguments, as we all know. So with meta being input here, it's not going to be evaluated, right? If it, it's expecting a text string, it's going to be confused when it finds this waiting for it. So does anybody have a potential solution to that problem? Can you just evaluate their arguments? Wait. Like evaluate the metaform? But when would I evaluate? You, you, you would like to let the file once yeah, so how would I do that? Anybody? Let's take a look at how I solve this. Well, you can maybe, if you want, you can run it through your own macro that takes everything that it doesn't know and just outputs it out directly. Right. And then everything it does know, it actually expands, and then it sends that. Right. To the well, yeah, then you kind of have a multi-stage compilation. Like yeah. you have your text file, you almost have to generate a separate text file with the final code, I mean, right? That would be, uh, I mean, that's one possibility. If you, didn't, if you weren't mm -hmm. able to change to who in any way, then you'd say, okay, I'll just... Do some stuff in the beginning, and then I'll send the rest. Right. I'll send the so the three, yeah. Thing to that in the middle of this so the three core systems in Seed are generate, modulate, and sublimate. Mm -hmm. Generate is responsible for the growth and development of systems. Modulate is responsible for translating the internal Lisp code into that external manifestation that's displayable in the browser. And then sublimate is the shortest, but in some ways the sweetest. So can you see what's going on here? Instantiate priority macro reader. What's going on here? So you're, you're okay. So you're um, so you're using a reader macro. Yes. Okay. And then you're basically looking. I guess you're. How? how what? Um, what is the character of the uh, The character is the opening parenthesis. Okay. So I overload the opening parenthesis okay. itself. And then you look for the string meta. I look for the string meta. meta. It. If it's meta, then evaluate, then expand the macro, which the meta, the actual runtime expansion of the meta macro is always just car, whatever you got. Yeah, okay. That's why we're using meta a lot. So I was yeah. about that. <laughs> so meta always gets expanded to its first argument, so the meta forms go away and you're happy. Could you input meta is just a macro. Oh, because you want it to get. Because it has to work inside macros as well. You, you want it to happen. You want its expansion to happen before macro expansion. Yes. It's needed to happen at a special time before any other macros expand. Which is free time. That's yes. Like so that is the seed sublimate system. 
a small hack that makes a big difference. So you could probably use another stage to list, you know, list what type one in some sense. Because you could write your own like read. You could do read, um, you know, expand or you know, substitute metas and then compile or something like that. Oh yeah, if there's a way to do that, I'd be interested. It wouldn't work with the file. It would only really work if you do the data inline or the data compilation, not not file inline. Right. So this again is that I/O spec. Oops. And then like we talked about before, Seed's interface is fully data-driven. So let's take a look at just what goes into building the stage. To do that, we're simply going to build the stage. This is the code for the stage. You see I have the title portal.demo portal.demo1 as it appears up here. And I have the demo drawing and demo sheet options. And then I have the large stages, which are defined by all of this. And then I have branches adjunct, which contains clipboard and history, as you see over here. So this is an entirely data-driven interface. You could reconfigure it drastically, use other uh, manifestations. It's all just down to the React components and how you generate them. So, okay, so basically, like, what I'm getting at, what I'm getting from this, mm -hmm. is that you, that meta thing is basically, it's, you're trying to create a persistible presentation type, like clean presentation types um, kind of thing. Correct. Right. So we need some way of representing the presentation type of object rather than just the object itself. Yes. And then each of these React components is written in parent script and uses list macros to expedite certain uh, functions. Let's go, let's check out basically how controls work. So this is all the code that's used to render the atoms and lists inside of, there we have render list. This renders the atoms and lists that you see in a form. So this macro, handle actions, generates a bunch of JavaScript that helps handle the keyboard actions as received by the branches. So I mentioned before I can use my arrow keys to move around. I can also use HJKL to move around. I can, let's do a few changes here. I can hold the W key and press left to undo, or I can press right to redo. So left undo, right redo. So Seed has what you could call a navigational interface. I represent as many functions as possible through navigational paradigms. So this is the chart of clipboard functions. So C plus left copies data from the clipboard to the branch point. This cop C plus right copies the data of the clipboard, and then up and down move you in the clipboard, uh, in the clipboard order. Can you address why you don't just persist everything immediately, since you have infinite undo and redo? Uh, how do you mean don't persist everything? I mean, the interface is like, you know, like uh, RASP's word process or wherever, whatever you do is, is persistent immediately. I think you, you can't fix it. It, it is. You push it safe stuff. Yeah. Oh, uh, that is an option. So if you wanted to do that, remember how I had that if param save in the, the I.O. structure? 
I could go without that and simply every time there's a change I could save the file. So I've chosen to do save just because that seems more orderly and less like surprising if you make changes that you didn't want to save to your file and then you end up in a situation where you can't get back to the old How file that you have. Uh, well, because if you... Save undo states, and then you, you can if you start... If well, you yes, if undo. currently I don't save undo states, but I could have the option to always save them to file every single time. So then that could you give you that option unless there was a crash or something that corrupted your state. I don't know. But, uh, you know, those options are all there, and they're doable with uh, changes of, like, a couple lines of code. So yeah. it's easy to experiment with whatever you like. Also... Do you deliver using this system, or do you only develop using this system? Uh, like deliver this interface to users? Yeah. Uh, the project, the plan is to develop more user-facing interfaces. Basically, my idea is the fundament of any good interface should be a Turing complete language. So the fundament of this interface is the Lisp grid display. On top of that, you layer the uh, interface elements, and eventually you can obscure that whole display. So you could deliver something like the Scenario Engine. Also, I'm, I've, I mentioned before this rich text editor. With rich text, you could create a CMS similar to WordPress or something like that, deliver that, and then uh, users may be none the wiser that there's Lisp code going on under the surface. They could just be filling out their, they could just be writing their text articles and publishing them using some drag and drop interface. But it would always be possible to go down to the lower level. Correct. So you wouldn't want to use this to implement an ATM? Uh, well, if you blocked off, if you block off the, uh, the lower level, or what I would do in that case is use the, gen cre use the CLWHO to create an HTML interface, which then um, communicates with the seed backend via AJAX. And you could use the I.O. spec to implement security protocols so each communication channel would have some security hoops that it goes through, make sure that no untoward input is happening. So, okay, and then I was talking about actions. So this is where you handle movement. So this form.base has movement. And then let's go to the mode sheet. So this is the same movement logic for the spreadsheet. And then notice that I'm moving my cursor around here. And also, if I hold the E key down, notice how the main and cells are interchanging. That's because when I do the E to the left, it moves the point into the main. And then if I hold E and push right, it sends my cursor into the cells. And then if I do E, left, left, now I'm exploring this. I hit enter, and I'm now at the APL in space. So you can use this, uh, you know, you can use keyboard navigation, which is consistent across interfaces, and also lets you move through the higher level interface. So notice I can move through the node structure the same way. And then over here, I hit E right, go over here, move my point here. Let's change the node name, and it's changed over on the left. So the intention is that this, this movement can quickly become instinctive for users. <coughs> so yeah, this is what we talked about before. Seed programmers can recognize design patterns by sight. Talk a bit about the symbols there. Seed is designed to be usable with a keyboard alone as well as with the mouse. And many of them combine the directional keys with letter keys. So this <coughs> is what I always saw as a step up from Emacs and Vim. Those editors are grounded in the, uh, you know, the traditional way of keyboard input, where there is no such thing as a key down instance. Holding down a key just rapid fires that key event. And if you wanted to add like C plus L functionality to Vim, you would have to develop a key eventing system for Vim or Emacs. But with browsers, we have the benefit of having that abstraction layer on top with key down, key up events. That means that we can combine letters and do things which uh, we can create the navigational interface, which I see is much more intuitive than the traditional stuff you get in Vim and Emacs. Because many different tasks, like as we've seen do, un un undo, redo, and clipboard, 
can be abstracted in a friendly way using navigation. And then this is the key, what the key interface spec looks like. We'll take a look at this in the actual code. So a lot of this you see here is the UI spec and UI model systems. And these are all generating HTML and React components. So let's go to the keys base. And this defines the key combinations and what they do. So this is a macro that generates JSON that is taken up by a library called keypress.js to implement the key combinations. And we looked at the APL system before. So APL is fun, but it's not so much fun if you can't output those characters. So 3, 4, and I hit Control R for row, iota, 9. So how did I implement this? It was a simple variation on the key input spec. It allows me to remap an entire section of keys, and in this case, remap them when combined with control or shift control. Now I have all of these special characters available to me. And one more thing you may have noticed, oh, and something I may not have addressed, is this portal.lisp, is the core of this portal.demo1. And the way seed works is the, fund, the, the root of any seed interface is called a portal. Portal is just an, a seed system that supports user interaction directly. And these portals have systems that they connect to. So portal.demo, so see this is an IO spec for the portal. Portals have a simple IO spec and the, important, the main important thing in here is it has contacts, and these are the demo sheet and demo drawing systems. So you see here demo sheet, demo drawing. Okay, so those are two different systems mm -hmm. within this portal. Yes, they are. Uh, so portal.demo1 is an ASDS system that manifests a user interface and it connect, it, uh, its contacts, so to speak, are demo sheet and demo drawing. So those are these systems that you can interact with through that portal. And those are also ASDF? Yes, they're also AS, yeah. ASDF systems are basically the fundamental element of seed. In Emacs, your fundamental element is the text buffer. And this is why, you know, this is one of the problems I see with Emacs, I mean, really, Many people see Emacs as Lisp's flagship product, kind of, but I'm getting to see Emacs as Lisp's albatross because Emacs is founded, it's, it's, it was a big leap from uh, line editors and teletype terminals when it came out. But with, uh, with the time that's, in the time that's passed since then, we can see just how strongly rooted it still is in teletype terminal concepts because its main interactive element is the text buffer. And text buffers are nice, but we can, we have interfaces and structures that are very unlike text buffers, and implementing them through Emacs can be a pain. And Emacs runs on kind of a poor dialect of Lisp as is. So this is a, an opportunity to have a new Lisp interface running in common Lisp and supporting uh, making many fewer assumptions about what kind of interface you're going to run. So anyway, these are the contacts for the portal. And then in this portal, this defines how the atoms and forms are converted to and from Lisp and into the browser. This media, these media are each of the elements that are available for users of the These are the elements available for the I.O. specs. Remember, get file text, put file, get image, put image. The, all of these are part of a macro that's fed to a larger macro called till and generates the functions that handle input and output for a seed system. So 
the media spec here is how I define what is available when I'm writing that I.O. spec for each uh, system. This runs a test and then this big macro generates the browser interface. This line is where I have my page title and then I set, different, I, ha I set up the different view modes that are available to me. So it's all plugins based. Like I said, the three fundamental seed systems are the generate, modulate, and sublimate. Everything else is a plugin of some kind. And then here I have my CSS. Now remember that star field animation that starts up? That's defined here, the, animate, the silicon sky animation. And then you may have noticed that I don't use dash separation, but I use camel case to, gen to display lisp symbols. I like camel case better, but maybe some of you like dash uh, separation better. There are many holy wars that go on in programming communities over things like tabs and underscores versus dashes or camel case. But what if you just have it any way you wanted? build the system. Ta-da! Nice. So it's all just CSS using rules to say either the first because these are actually disparate elements. Yeah. <laughs> Let's analyze it. So see, they're all separate spans. Mm -hmm. And then if a certain class is present, I capitalize this letter and I put a dot between, and I always have a dot between them. So because what's really going on in a Lisp symbol, now when I started with Lisp, I thought case insensitive, like what century is this? Mm -hmm. But then I came to understand case insensitivity is really the better option because you're always gonna capitalize the same way, right? I mean, if you're doing things remotely competently, you're going you're gonna to use camel case if you're doing capitals or dash separation or underscores or whatever. But uh, the real important thing is it's series of characters separated by some kind of delimiter. And then you have like two delimiters. You have like a minor delimiter, which is usually the dash and lisp, and then a major delimiter, which is usually the period. So you could use, I could set up a style to use the hash sign for your major delimiter and the caret sign for your minor delimiter or whatever you wanted. So with seed, you can have your display any way you want it. And this is also where I add that uh, APL key set. See, I use the key, I have the key UI keystroke maps is kind of the top level uh, macro and then this APL meta specialized is a different one but I actually created another APL using the uh, using the super key or Windows key so if you don't like using the control you can use Windows and I think that what about shift? APL key where do you shift? <clears throat> uh, well you use shift in a combination with another key so with APL, you always have a super combo and a shift super combo. Because each key has two special symbols associated with it. So what are our takeaways? A new vanguard for Lisp in the world of end users. You could say lots of languages have their, you know, kind of flagship, the thing that represents them to end users and makes them real, like Rails for Ruby, Django for Python, um, you know, WordPress and a dozen other things for PHP, but what is Lisp's, you know, what outpost does Lisp have in the world of just day-to-day -day users? I think C could be that if it can expand and meet the needs of uh, people in, you know, different fields. And the intention of Seed is that it can be used to build custom workflows, make possible tasks that have been very difficult to impossible before. That's, that was my goal with the scenario engine, to make 
the creation of interactive narratives accessible to writers and people who didn't want to have a programmer standing over their shoulder all the time. And I think Seed can do that for many more workflows, many more use cases. So web applications can work locally, remotely, and be adaptable to many tasks. You could run, like this Seed is running on my computer, but you can run Seed on a server as well, of course. And I'm also working on provisions for Seed systems to network and talk with each other. So just as they communicate with the browser, the browsers, uh, the code generated in the browser is converted to Lisp and sent to the Seed instance. Seed instances can talk with each other directly in Lisp without having to convert it. Of course, there will be uh, security measures in place through the I.O. channels. But uh, one use case I imagined is if, you cr if I create that rich text editor, let's say a company uses it for people writing all their internal materials. Now, many companies have a corporate style guide. For instance, Nintendo used to Low, they used to uh, prevent anyone from, talk, from writing about cartridges. They didn't like cartridges, so you had to call them game packs. So imagine if uh, I, as the Nintendo editor-in-chief, create my seed-based editor for all marketing materials, and any time I have an interface for creating custom style rules, I say grammar check is verboten, and any time anybody writes grammar check, it's going to underline it, do a wavy underline, send a message saying correct that. And additionally, whenever that happens, I'm going to get a running total of grammar of these mistakes made by people. Those things are going to get sent to my seed instance. I'm going to see some kind of chart that gets output. And if I see certain mistake being made a lot, I can send out an email saying, hey, uh, just a reminder, we say this in this way. So. That's one, that's one use case, but I can see much more sophisticated ones on the horizon. Yes. Yes, if you want to integrate your, a seed-based payroll, you could make it really creepy. You know, you talk about having a grammar system, right? I mean, that would be the marketing grammar, right? It's yes. a way of saying something like, cartridge, ooh, it's wiggly lines, don't use cartridge, use this. Like Correct. That. Adding rules. Yes. And then seed, seed folds code into custom interface elements, makes what was complicated at least relatively simpler. And by doing that, we can fold the space. By folding code, you essentially fold idea space. So places that seemed impossible or difficult to get to can be within reach. And that's that. Thanks to everyone for coming out today. For now, I'll open the floor to questions. Anything more to ask? That's a yes? lot of stuff to take in, actually. It's, it's, it, you've, uh, well, my takeaway from this uh, talk is that you, you have a, a very um, interesting, I've never seen before take on how to do certain things, and I, I was just like fascinated by, um, you know, like the diagraphs that, mm -hmm. that we're showing. Um, the dendrograms? Yeah, yeah, the dendrograms, sorry. I forgot the word, but it's very interesting. There were some, yes. So I saw you had the narrative engine. You can see it actually produced, I saw like the final output of the narrative engine where you're actually clicking through all the slides. You can see it actually produced like some external app like that. Uh, I haven't built that yet, but um, it's certainly possible to create a web application that talks to it via Ajax. Well, I, saw, like, I know like Excel, I'm not sure like, if the end user would use like, the, um, the diagrams and like, the, yeah, the sheets, but like, if you could use that to then like, build an interactive form for the end user. Correct. So, and also, the end user would never build anything like the data flow language. But you can have layers of interfaces on top of it. The simplest interface for specifying your system would just be a drop down. You know, click on the drop down, I want a spreadsheet, or I want a rich text editor. Then, beyond that, you could have maybe a few fillable fields, which populate different elements within that, uh, you know, within that I.O. spec. And from there, you could go more and more complicated until you have lists of things, you know, something like that Fibonacci diagram where you have erasable lists of items with fillable fields and checkboxes and stuff informing what kind of a system you want to build. Was there somebody?
the, uh, the tree um, the tree display code. I remember something. Uh, name it. I'm blocking on the name. Both of the author and of the system, but uh, it had to do with um, it had to, it was that idea where you you essentially constructed things with um, by uh, by dragging and dropping. And one of the one of the points of it was that names were names were purely for documentation. Are you thinking about pure data? No. It was a visual programming system. No, it didn't. That definitely wasn't the name. I think it was on the land of the ultimate some year back. Does anyone remember it? Um, no. I wish I could think of it, but um, yeah, the essential point was mm -hmm. that if you drew a line between two things, then they were the two points on the graph, and they were the same. Correct. It didn't, as opposed to the the standard approach, which is two things are the same if they have the same thing. Right. Yes, in the uh, in the graph I have also names are basically symbolic. Gwids are used under the hood, but you don't have to deal with those yourself. Yeah. Anything else? Yes? Um, is there anything in the future for like a real time system where like, oh, you go, so it's, a, I don't, it's not like necessarily like a fraction of the page, but like you have a system where the user is like editing on one server and then get at like trigger events on another server? Uh, correct. Well, right now, the gro so each time you change something, I invoke a function called grow. So any kind of change is called growth. You know, even death is a kind of growth, is an apoptosis. But uh, so the growth right now is just user driven. So user saves, user changes something, triggers a growth. But you could also run a JavaScript ticker basically to automatically trigger growth in the system and automatically refresh the state from what's online. If you have systems networked and talking to each other, you can have systems where uh, there's real time interaction happening independent of any user activity. All right, well, thanks, everyone. I do have another question. Yes, uh, Arthur. Have you ever thought about using this for as a, um, um, a kind of very smart shell? Okay. Like, for example, one thing I've, I've always thought about is like, uh, you know, like, you know, you have, you have commands like ls, right, when we want to see what the current directory is. Would be nice oh, yes, well, I have, like, I have not implemented a REPL yet, mm -hmm. but that is on the horizon, and a basically Lisp-type interface. Mm -hmm. Because, uh, well, I see a step above a REPL is something like an expandable control panel. Mm -hmm. Often in your REPL, you're probably running the same few commands over and over again mm -hmm. a lot, right? What if you created them almost like keys on a keyboard, you could have perhaps a, a tablet as one of your design tools, add buttons or uh, elements on that tablet that you can then touch to run that command again. Mm -hmm. You could also have the output of that command uh, either, you could either have a separate list of the output or you could have each output associated with each input. And then some inputs could be directly, like we were, we were talking about a moment ago, some outputs could be user driven all the time and some outputs could say refresh at intervals like say uh, ls in a directory every five seconds and display some kind of visual listing of what's there. Yeah, you know, or like, it, you know, creating a, input, basically saying, okay, I want to know what the current directory is, right? That would be, a, it, it ends up saying, okay, take a CD and say, make a window and boom. Yeah. You have like a, you have a file system thing, right? And you yeah. click on it and you change directory or something like right. that. Right. Well, yeah, so sir, yeah. Words, you just kind of make visual when right now we can write a lot of commands in, right? Well, yes, and, and this, nice one, of, one of the intentions here is, is is there something that could supplant the command line? Because yeah. obviously no GUI right now is going to give you the flexibility of what you get in the command line. Could this finally be the thing that could obviate that and create a, a truly flexible graphical model? Yes? Klim at its heart does all that. Uh, what was that? Klim. Uh, Klim. It, it, it has like, you, you, you do like a list directory and then you can click on the elements Right. In that directory, you can manipulate them. You can click on them to you know, list what's inside of that, or you can right click and have a whole bunch of commands. Right. I don't think I've used that tool yet, but I can look into it's it. It's a standard thing. It was, it was part of some models. Right. Well, yeah, I've seen, uh, I've seen the, the list machine material. So it's, it's the same UI, which is right. it's just a standardized machine. Right. There was a system called Metaphor back in the 80s, which um, I'm still trying to wrap was a graphic system for graphically designing pipelines. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, draw boxes, draw lines between them, 
uh, click on a box, you know, it pops up the, the options that that box might have. Right. So yeah, many of the same concepts in play here. Mm -hmm. But I would wonder how much, how much distance was between the interface and the implementation in that system, and how, uh, you know, how much it could be understood by steps. The real key with seed is that the distance between implementation and code is relatively short, and you can understand it in a step-by-step -step fashion. Whereas, for instance, in that scenario engine I showed you, there's thousands of lines dedicated to translating what you see on the screen versus what's run on the server and what's stored in the database. I think if you have a system that's that complex, eventually you need those layers to abstract. Like, if you do a directory listing, you're not going to immediately get to the, the things that, that give you all the commands that are associated with each element of the directory listing and the actual directory listing. Well, yes, you're going to need to put layers in between. But the key to the layers is that you could understand each layer fairly easily once you understand the previous one. With, yeah, with, that's, that's with, yeah. 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 One, with, one of the virtues of Bash is that you don't have to know how the commands you run are written. Right. Yeah. They are encapsulated from you. Correct. All right, well, thanks so much, everyone, okay. for coming here today. minutes over here so if you want to continue asking questions a little bit more informally and then um, I'm going to run an experiment I hope you guys join me I'm going to see what happens if we take C and put it to a pint of beer and I want to see what grows mm -hmm. out of it so if you're interested in doing that uh, we're going to be meeting at uh, Homeland Brewery it's right in the Port Authority um, if you or you can follow me, I'm um, going to be going there as soon as I break everything up. And then one last thing, this is Seed on GitHub, if you'd like to fork and play with it yourself. So yeah, with that, um, thank you for, uh, we'll, we'll adjourn the formal meeting, and then soon we'll do the, you know, and so we'll turn the lights on.